H. H. Holmes. When most people think of a serial killer, they picture someone like Jack the Ripper or Ted Bundy, luring or kidnapping innocent victims off of the street and murdering them in a secluded area. While there are certainly a fair number of these types of killers, history has provided us with a unique few that differentiate their murdering through more than just sheer numbers. H. H. Holmes is one of these few, who despite his relatively short life, managed to make a name for himself across America due to his intelligence, maliciousness, and his pathological lying. A great number of rumors and legends sprang up after his death, but his real story is startling enough. Holmes was born as Herman Webster Mudgett in New Hampshire in 1861 to a wealthy Methodist family. A number of stories would later emerge about his childhood, including examples of abuse and Holmes torturing animals, but it's likely these are fabrications. After graduating high school, Holmes took a few teaching jobs and married his first wife, Clara, having one child with her. When Holmes was 21, he enrolled in the University of Michigan, studying anatomy in the Department of Medicine and Surgery. Holmes would later admit to using cadavers while in college to defraud life insurance companies. Although amidst his numerous other obvious lies, it's unclear if this is factual. Holmes's housemates claimed that he treated Clara violently, and so in 1884, she moved back to New Hampshire, breaking off all connection with him. After graduating, he moved to New York for a short time, but a rumor spread that Holmes was the last person seen with a missing boy, and Holmes quickly moved again. Next, he moved to Philadelphia, but again moved quickly after a boy died who took medicine from the drugstore Holmes worked at. While it's entirely unclear if Holmes was actively involved in these cases, it is clear that he moved away after their occurrence. Holmes changed his name at this point to Henry Howard Holmes, before moving to Chicago around 1886. Holmes once again found employment at a drugstore, owned by Dr. Elizabeth S. Holton. A number of stories have appeared about this time period in the last century, most notably that Holmes would go on to force Holton to sell him the store before he killed her and her husband. The facts, however, show that Holton was a fellow graduate of the University of Michigan, and she and her husband would both go on to outlive Holmes. She did sell the drugstore to Holmes for reasons unknown, possibly to focus on motherhood, and it is quite possible that Holmes failed to pay her for the sale, as was typical of him. Around this time, while still technically married to his first wife, Holmes married Myrta Belknap, who he would have a daughter with. Holmes would then purchase an empty lot across from his drugstore, with the idea of constructing a mixed-use building, retail spaces on the first floor, and apartments on the second. Holmes would utilize a number of architects and builders throughout the construction process so that only he knew the full layout of the building. The construction included a maze of hallways and staircases, secret passages, trap doors, and soundproof rooms. The murder castle, as it came to be known, was built with the capabilities of Holmes easily asphyxiating a resident and disposing of the body without anyone knowing. Supposedly, the bodies found their way into the basement, where stories tell that acid vats and a crematorium were located to help dispose of bodies. In addition to all these macabre intentions, Holmes also managed to work his way out of pain for most of the labor and materials, as well as anyone looking too closely at what he was building. In 1892, he would build on a third floor, telling investors that it was going to be used as a hotel for the upcoming World's Fair, but evidence seems to show that the hotel was never actually open for business. The early 1890s would be when Holmes seems to have started his killing career, possibly being responsible for killing four people who worked in his building. Apparently, Holmes would require women to take out life insurance policies if they wanted the job, and he would manage to collect on them after murdering the women. During this time, he met his partner in crime, Benjamin Peitzel, who would assist Holmes in a number of criminal endeavors. 
It's entirely unclear exactly how many people Holmes murdered during this time period. As a large amount of people moved through Chicago, especially during the World's Fair, combined with Holmes' aptitude at disposing of bodies, means he could have easily killed dozens. In 1893, he met a woman named Minnie Williams, whom he hired to be his personal stenographer, and soon afterwards convinced her to transfer a deed to a property in Texas to him. Holmes served as the notary for this transfer, and the two apparently began living together. A couple of months later, Minnie's sister visited her in Chicago. The two women were never seen alive again. By 1894, the insurance scams and other fraudulent crimes were catching up to Holmes, and although they had no knowledge of the murders going on, various companies were becoming increasingly interested in Holmes. Things came to a head when Holmes decided to burn the third floor of his building, hoping to collect on some more insurance money. The insurance company wasn't buying it at this point, however, and they were planning to prosecute him for arson, so Holmes left Chicago. He headed to Texas, where he planned on using the property he acquired from Minnie Williams to build a new castle and start over again. This Texas castle was similar to the first one, although perhaps even more elaborate. Although it seems that Holmes did manage to finish building it, it was never actually used. Holmes was arrested for the first time for selling mortgaged goods in Missouri, and while in jail, he spent some time talking to an outlaw named Marion Hedgepeth. For whatever reason, Holmes told Hedgepeth about a plan he had to fake his own death and collect his own $10,000 life insurance policy. Holmes was looking for a trustworthy lawyer to handle the scam, and offered Hedgepeth $500 if he could direct him towards one. Hedgepeth agreed, and Holmes ended up going through with the plan, but the insurance company refused to pay out. Holmes then decided to have his associate, Peitzel, attempt the same scam. Peitzel was going to fake his own death while pretending to be an inventor who gets killed in a lab explosion, with Holmes providing a cadaver to stand in for Peitzel. Holmes, however, murdered Peitzel and collected the $10,000. After this, Holmes would convince Peitzel's wife to allow three of her five children to travel with him, while telling her that Benjamin was currently hiding out in London. Holmes took the children across the United States and Canada, while also leading Peitzel's wife and other children along a similar route. Holmes was also spending time with his current wife during this period, unaware of the whole situation, showing Holmes' prowess of deceit and persuasion. The bodies of the three children were later found, the two daughters asphyxiated in a trunk, and the boy drugged and butchered. By this point, a number of companies and states wanted Holmes found, and so detectives were sent across the country to track him down. Frank Geyer, a Philadelphia detective, was responsible for finding the three Peitzel children's bodies, and the Pinkerton Detective Agency managed to finally capture Holmes himself. Interestingly enough, the Pinkertons were able to find Holmes based on information gleamed from Marion Hedgepeth, whom Holmes had never paid the $500 he promised him. Hedgepeth was pardoned for his crimes because of this. The castle in Chicago was searched, but no evidence was found that could convict Holmes. Therefore, Holmes was put on trial only for the murder of Benjamin Peitzel, the one murder they could specifically connect to him. Holmes' trial was national news, as he was dubbed the criminal of the century, and it was pretty clear that he had murdered more than just Benjamin. After being found guilty and sentenced to death, Holmes gave out a number of different confessions, including his innocence, his possession by Satan, and confessing to a slew of other murders, some of whom were still alive. Holmes clearly could not stop his lies and so his actual story and body count became incredibly murky due to how many stories he threw out there. Holmes asked that his coffin be buried in cement ten feet deep, as he was concerned that his body would be stolen away for dissection in a lab. Holmes was hung on May 7, 1896, slowly strangling to death over the course of 15 minutes. 
His final request was granted, and he was buried in cement, although the coffin would later be dug up in 2017, after allegations that Holmes had actually escaped execution. Holmes' body was found in very good condition in the coffin due to the cement, and he was reburied. His castle in Chicago had been burned by a fire before his execution in 1895, apparently an act of arson, but it was still used before finally being torn down in 1938. H. H. Holmes is often regarded as one of America's first serial killers, and although his reported body count ranges from around 9 all the way up to 200, his life grabbed the nation's interest for decades. Although history has remembered the killings of Jack the Ripper far more, which only occurred a few years before Holmes's, Holmes was definitely responsible for more murders, and arguably more brutal ones. Aside from just his career as a serial killer, though, Holmes's propensity for lying and scamming, despite him possessing the skills and intellect to make a very good, honest living, is just one of the curious aspects of life. While much like the identity of Jack the Ripper, we might never know the complete true story of Holmes's life, but it's clear that some people just aren't playing the same game as the rest of us.